I'm privileged to be speaking to you today. Um, just by way of introduction I'm, as to how we will present this, I will be popping in and out with some slides as the talk progresses. It's a bit of a hybrid presentation. It can be a bit boring looking at me all the time. And similarly, the slides can be a bit distracting. So we hope this works well. Um, some slides will be up for longer than others. The later slides will be up for less time. They generally include a quote and also have a URL on there if you want to look up further information uh, about the, the people I'm speaking about. So that's that's something there for future reference. But welcome, and we'll start now with, with our first slide, where, um, as Malcolm said, baptism is, is the gateway into the church. Baptism is how we become members of the church. And with baptism comes responsibility. There are three sacraments where anointing takes place, in baptism, in confirmation, and in ordination. But anointing also takes place in the rite of consecrating a king or a queen. And in anointing, when we are anointed, we are anointed for mission. Each of those sacraments carries a mission. And through that mission, we share in the prophetic, priestly and kingly mission of Christ. And I'll elaborate on that a little bit later. But through baptism, we also receive a vocation. And I often say that there is no crisis of vocation, but rather we have a crisis of discernment. And I'll pose the question at the end too. What would the world look like if all the baptised realised they had a vocation and took that vocation seriously? And, and, and there is a challenge. That's a challenge for the ordained and it's a challenge for the laity. Because how does the average lay person discern that vocation. Those clues are written into our very being as baptised members of the body of Christ. Through baptism, we receive spiritual gifts, which are a clue to our vocation. And we discern, ideally, we discern our vocation in the context of the church's teachings, in who we are and our encounter with the person of Christ and where he calls us, who we are as he created us, and our passions. And where those things come together is likely to be the area of our vocation. Lay people have a critical role in the mission of the church. The Vatican II document, Lumen Gentium, tells us that the laity are called to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Because it, because it is they who take Christ to those places where he would not otherwise be known. It's the laity who witness to Christ in all the places where we live out our lives, the sporting field, the boardroom, the schools, the shopping centres. And those of you who've been attending the keynotes, you would notice that at the beginning of each keynote, we've had a prayer from St John Paul II for Catholic evangelization, And as part of that prayer, we've been saying, May they come to know his all-surpassing love and may that love transform every element of society. And it's largely with the laity that we trans... It's largely the laity who have the task of transforming that society. So if we go to the, the second slide now, um, our most recent popes have spoken very clearly about this role of the laity. Pope John Paul II spoke about evangelising the culture. And if you look at his document, Christopher Daly's Laity, which is about the role of the laity in the church, he identifies a whole host of areas where lay people transform the culture in which we live. He talks about promoting the dignity of the human person. He talks about respect for life, religious liberty, promoting marriage and family life engaging in works of charity, serving in public life, promoting social and economic justice. These are things we do as lay people wherever our life takes us. Then we have Benedict XVI, and he reintroduced us to the idea of co-responsibility. I'm told by people that that 
term was quite prevalent at the time of the Second Vatican Council, and then it lay a bit dormant until one day in 2009 when Pope Benedict was speaking to the priests and lay people of Rome, the pastoral workers of Rome, and he said that lay people were no, not just collaborators with the priests, which makes them sound a bit like, you know, helpers, but that they were actually co-responsible for the mission of the church through baptism, the laity have an equal share in that mission. They are not second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. And then Pope Francis speaks of all the baptised being called to be missionary disciples. It's not about sitting in the, at the feet of Jesus, but about putting on his sandals and to walk in the world as though they fit. And here we have a quote from, from Pope Francis, which I think is, is, is an interesting quote, which points to the distinction between the laity and the ordained. But as I said earlier, the laity and the ordained, are, the laity are not second class citizens in the kingdom of God, but they have a different function. And the quote says, if the heart of the priest's identity lies in consecrating the Eucharistic bread, the centre of the lay mission consists in consecrating the world according to God's plan. So there's a distinction there between the ordained and the laity, but it's only a distinction that exists within the church. This is a bringing together of the hierarchical gifts. They are the gifts of governance of the church and the baptismal gifts that are given to all the baptised. The church, through the gift of governance, should provide the formation and the nourishment that the laity need for the vocational journal, journey to which they are called. And the laity share in the prophetic, priestly and kingly mission of Christ. So what does this mean for the ordained person? As prophets, we are called to speak the truth. We are called to live a life of integrity. We are to be prepared to be countercultural in our society, to live in a way that would not make sense if God did not exist. And I'll repeat that because it's an interesting challenge to live our lives in a way that would not make sense if God did not exist. And the function of priest is seen as to bless, to make holy, to sanctify. And that's what we're called to do in our own lives and in our relationships. We're called to make our lives holy to make our relationships holy. And we had some beautiful examples in the keynotes in the last few days, beginning with our own family and our outreach to others through the domestic church. But we are also called to make the society and the culture in which we live holy so that it respects human dignity and works towards the common good where all people are able to flourish. And kingly, the sovereign, the king, the queen, have power, authority and jurisdiction to do the job that they are called to do. As lay people, we also have that power and authority and jurisdiction to live out our vocation in a way that is much more creative than that of the ordained. And I'll explain this. The next slide um, looks at someone who was truly creative and countercultural. Dorothy Day is a wonderful example of the lay vocation. She was born in New York in 1897. She was a journalist and joined the Communist Party. She was a radical activist, a single mother who had experienced an abortion. But she became a devout Catholic after the birth of her only child. Interestingly, after her conversion, she lost none of her radicalness but it was illumined by her study of Catholic social teaching. With Peter Moran, she founded The Catholic Worker, a weekly newspaper dedicated to committing to, to promoting Catholic social justice. They established houses of hospitality around the country for the homeless during the Great Depression when thousands were experiencing severe distress and poverty. The work she undertook was innovative and secular. By secular, I mean it was grounded in the world. It was a service to the world. It was undertaken in the name of Christ and his church and for the poor. Dorothy Day was always on the edge. The hierarchy didn't know what to do with her. 
Some bishops supported her, others were suspicious because much of what she was saying and doing was quite frankly not possible for the ordained person to do. She actively demonstrated against racism, war, economic injustice, and at times spent was in jail for these activities. The last time she was in jail, she was 75. She died in 1980 at the age of 83. Now we don't have to agree with what she did or her means of doing this. She worked in her own sphere, that is her own jurisdiction, and she acted according to her own judgment, but it was a judgment that was informed by the teachings of the church. She was free to be innovative because she was a laywoman. She was not committing the whole church to a particular course of action, but was acting personally on behalf of the church for the sake of the mission of Christ to the world. Lay people have this freedom to be creative and innovative in the secular world, more so than clergy or religious. You can imagine your local priest doing what she did and they'd be called in to answer to the bishop. Dorothy was able to do this because she was responding to her personal call and acting within her specific area of influence. She was not committing the church, but she taught the church a lot about the radical commitment to gospel values. Closer to home, in colonial Australia in the 1840s and 1850s, Caroline Chisholm first became active by rescuing thousands of young women from the streets of Sydney and finding them meaningful work across the early colonies. When she came to Australia in the 1840s, the sexual imbalance, most, most residents in the colony were soldiers or former convicts, and the government was trying to recruit women to balance the numbers. But in fact, what was happening is some of these women were being literally dumped on the streets of Sydney, and many of them were being recruited into prostitution. So Caroline Chisholm actually set up Australia's first free employment agency and was able to find work for these women from as far north as Brisbane down to Canberra, where, is now, where Canberra is now, around Goulburn and Yass. Further to that, she assisted the settlement of thousands of poor families from England to a better life in Australia. She reformed passenger shipping because her ships were the first ships that came to Australia without a death on board. And the only reason there weren't any deaths on board is she didn't overcrowd the ships. So she wasn't in it to make money. She was in it to respect the dignity of the people she was helping. She was married and the mother of nine six of whom attained adulthood. She had a gift, an extraordinary gift of wisdom where she was able to find practical solutions to contemporary social problems. And in explaining her vocation, she wrote, I was impressed with the idea that God had in a peculiar manner fitted me for this work. On Easter Sunday, I was able to make an offering of my gifts to the God who gave them. I felt my offering was accepted and God's blessing was on my work. Caroline Chisholm may have been writing about the discernment of gifts in, in that passage, and she was certainly empowered to live out her vocation in a supernatural way. In her own time, her own bishop did not fully understand her mission. Archbishop Polding wrote, oh, well, sorry, about her relationship with Archbishop Polding, um, Timothy Sutton, a historian of, of colonial Australia, he wrote that Caroline Chisholm was the most influential lay Catholic in Polding's jurisdiction, but he completely failed to grasp her importance. His country was ready for a lay and social apostolate conducted by women, as Mrs Chisholm proved but he had no language with which to take possession of such a concept. Hers was an apostolic sanctity beyond the range of vision, not of Polding alone, but of most of her contemporaries. 
Both Dorothy Day and Caroline Chisholm identified their vocation and lived it out within their own baptismal jurisdiction in the world. There is an ambivalence towards the lay vocation which continues today and possibly associated with the fact that it's lived outside the church rather than inside the church. And now, just if you thought that in order to live your lay vocation, you needed to be a social activist, we'll have a change of pace. Vocations are as diverse as the individuals who make up the body of Christ. No two people will live out the same vocation. And so here I look at Les Murray. Les Murray was probably one of the greatest poets writing in the English language. And what better way to shape culture than by writing poetry? His poetry is studied in schools and universities across the English speaking world and has also been translated into other languages. Les's poetry is not religious in the strict sense, although he did write some religious poems, but it is Catholic in the sense of it being universal and that his poetry celebrates language, beauty, relationships in a way that's respectful of creation and human dignity. And what I find interesting is that Les actually saw his poetry, writing poetry as his vocation. And prior to devoting himself to writing poetry full time, he'd had various government jobs, including a job probably with one of our secret services where he learnt a lot of languages and decoded a lot of codes. But he left that role and decided to write poetry. Basically, what happened is he's, he, he was the father of five children and his wife went back to teaching schools and he dedicated himself to poetry and, and he wrote um, a letter to a friend, which is quoted in his biography, which I think I, I will quote from it. And I think it shows that there are sacrifices to be made in following one's vocation. And so these, these are Les's words. I really have to go on finding grace enough to trust in divine providence, which has so far never let us down. I have to go on having the grace not to sacrifice myself, in this case, to some wage earning job, if I could get one with my record and at my age. While ever I go on doing this work, we will be provided for, barely, but sufficiently, I think I'm really in one of those darker sayings of Jesus, the sort that makes me ultimately cleave to him above any other contender. I'm the one which promises a person damnation if they put wife or child or father or mother before Christ. This quasi-priestly work of poetry is Christ for me. It's his life as I can live it by my efforts. Or to put it another way, it's my Christ nature made real and effective in the world. If I go back to one of the conventional and in most people perfectly laudable sacrifices, that of keeping my family, I will be lost. Difficult religion, this one. I think what always leaves me gasping at the end of that is the sacrifice that he felt he had to make for the sake of his vocation. And I think that sacrifice was there for Caroline Chisholm and it was there for Dorothy Day. At one stage, Caroline Chisholm was in England with, she was pregnant with her last pregnancy, her ninth pregnancy and five other children her husband had to come to Australia to meet the ships of immigrants because they couldn't afford to hire an agent in Australia. And she had to pull her children out of school because she couldn't afford to keep them there. And there's a letter she wrote to her bishop at the time, Bishop Ullathorne, and she said, I sometimes worry 
that my vocation has cost those I love most dearly. It, it, it's cost them um, advantages which they might have otherwise had if I had not felt so compelled um, to, to do this work. And, and the other interesting thing, I think, with Caroline Chisholm is um, she and her husband Archibald are an amazing model of a family that, well, a marriage where he committed to her vocation and he said he would support her in whatever God asked her to do. So I'm going to invite you to consider what the world might look like if all the baptised became intentional disciples and lived out their baptismal vocation. Thank you. And I have with me three special guests. Um, I have Robbie Curtis, I have Joanna Howe and Vicky Dunn. And I might start with Vicky and ask you, Vicky, if you can tell me a little, well, I'll ask each of you to tell me a little bit about yourself um, for our audience and for each other. Thanks, Thanks very much, Clara. Oh, are we right? Are we live? Yep. Thanks, Clara, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Vicky Dunn. I live in Canberra and I'm the mother of five adult children and the grandmother of three. Uh, I think I'm here because, uh, as Clara would know, I spent the last 20 odd years of my life as an elected member of parliament. And I think that the reason that I came into parliament was that I was I've always been involved in the pro-life movement and we spent a lot of time discerning that um, you could do a whole lot in the pro-life movement that you have to have. As one of my mentors, the, the late, great uh, John O. Johnson said, you need people of faith um, to join the political party of their choice and become active in that political party. And I spent um, a long time in the Liberal Party uh, and I spent 19 plus years, not quite 20 years, as a, um, an elected member in the ACT Legislative Assembly. Uh, I can't say that uh, it was an unalloyed success. Uh, there were many defeats along the way. Uh, I think most of what we did along the way was lose ground on the pro-life pause, as has been the case in the 21st century in Australia. Uh, but I still don't I don't uh, despair of, of what can be done and what needs to be done. I think I'll pass over to Clara. Okay, thanks, Robbie. We might hear from you now. Thanks, Clara. Great to be here today. Uh, my name is Robbie Curtis and uh, I live in Brisbane. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a husband to Catherine and father of seven children, five, uh, five daughters and two sons. And um, beyond the home, uh, I'm a Someone consider myself consider myself a Catholic urban missionary here in Brisbane. Um, 2003, I experienced deep sense of calling and stirring in my my uh, my faith life as an adult, post some troubled teenage years, and discovering personal passionate Catholic faith at 19. Uh, in 2003, at the beatification of Mother Teresa, experienced that deep stirring towards a a calling and a sense of purpose in my faith to serve and share with the, the broken, the, the poor, the marginalized, the outcast of, uh, of the world at the time. I was very young and, and green in that sense and that calling and that experience. And in 2008, experienced um, through uh, commitment to my faith life and, and uh, in a prayer life, uh, a deep sense of, of calling to uh, the poor and broken of my home city here in Brisbane. Uh, since that time, 2008, um, I've spent uh, my life beyond the family home uh, serving many of our, uh, of our poor and broken of the city of Brisbane through uh, the Emmanuel community and its Emmanuel City mission, which I pioneered um, nine years ago in South Brisbane. And we provided seven days a week a daytime centre at a zero cost to any person who's displaced, struggling, transitioning, um, being released back into the community and people of all race, color, background, 
um, to come and be cared for first and foremost to be to be fed at a zero cost to be um, cleansed through hygiene services and all sorts of very basic human services and more importantly than that um, a deep sense of calling to um, not just be a service provider but to be a point of renewal within the church in being a church that is uh, in the words of pope francis that is seeking to be poor with the poor a church that is seeking to be bruised dirty hurting uh, out amongst the street uh, seeking to be an expression of that field hospital for the sick as pope francis has so powerfully uh, called us to do so we we identify as an expression in uh, in this diocese of a lay movement uh, within the Emmanuel community and through the Emmanuel City Mission with the great support of the local church here um, to be a place for the poor and the broken of the city of Brisbane. And I've devoted my whole life to this day um, since conversion towards that work. Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. And now we'll hear from Joanna. Hi everybody, um, my name is Joanna Howe and I'm from um, Adelaide. Um, I'm a mum of five, uh, aged between two and 12. Um, and I work at the University of Adelaide as an associate professor in law. Um, in terms of all of this, I guess my heart is really for justice. I think that's the kind of calling that God's placed on my heart. And um, when I went to Oxford, I did my PhD on unfair dismissal law. So. Um, looking at what happens when someone is um, kind of at one of their lowest points because they've lost their job and they don't think it was done very fairly, whether through a fair process or for a fair reason. And um, my PhD work looked at like what can we do to help a person in that position. And since coming to Adelaide, I particularly focused on farm workers and I've tried in regions across Australia interviewing farm workers and employers and particularly focusing on migrants and there's five other people on my research team and just really looking at what can the Australian government and the community be doing um, to make sure that um, this very vulnerable group um, is protected when they work on Australian farms and uh, that's been the bulk of my academic career but more recently um, since South Australia legislated abortion up to birth uh, and that happened in March last I've really felt a stirring on my heart to speak out publicly on abortion. And I think Vicky's right that um, in many ways in Australia, we've just kept losing ground. And it's almost like the pro-life movement is at its lowest ebb. And I just feel I'm turning 40 next year and I feel like God's calling me to um, really speak into our culture and our society on this issue because if we are um, ending the lives of living human beings in the womb as a society, then that um, really is the greatest human rights challenge of our generation. So I've launched out on social media. You can follow me at Dr. Joanna Howe on Instagram and TikTok. Um, and I'm doing updates every day on this issue of abortion because I'm trying to, I guess, educate people about what this really is because most people don't have any idea what's going on in our own country. Thank you. I think, Joanna, you failed to mention how many children you had. <laughs> Oh, no, I said it at the beginning. I've got five. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. Well, thank you. And, and you kind of led into my next question, which was going to be how do you live out your mission in the world? So what I might ask you all to do is to perhaps tell me about an instance in living out your mission where you felt you did make a difference or where the mission made a difference to you. Um, I might go back to, to Vicky. Um, I've spent a lot of time in in the legislature. And before I was a member of the Legislative Assembly, I worked for a parliamentarian. And actually at that at that time in the ACT uh, in the in the late 1990s, in the previous century or millennium, uh, there was actually some uh, some innovative uh, legislation that was passed by a, uh, a crazy, brave, irritating um, parliamentarian at the time who was a, a former footballer by the name of Paul Osborne, who was called to um, the pro-life cause but was a bit... <sighs> was a hopeless politician in many ways uh, and wasn't very good at, at negotiating. But we eventually managed to have passed some what lasted for a, a three or four years in the ACT, some quite good um, 
pro-life legislation. And a lot of it revolved around careful negotiation with people who were not pro-life, but who you could sort of negotiate with to one point. Um, and it was very interesting because one of those people was a, another member of the Legislative Assembly. I wasn't a member at the time. I was working for the, the most obvious pro-life advocate in the parliament at the time. And the day before we um, passed the legislation, which uh, became known as the Osborne Bill and lasted for three or four years, at about 11 o'clock at night, we shook hands on a deal across the chamber. And one of those people said to me, as we walked out of the room, he said, or something along the lines of, um, I really didn't want to negotiate with you because I know what your views are and I thought you would be intransigent. And and he sort of complimented me. I wasn't nearly as intransigent as he thought. And he thought that, you know, all pro-life Catholics were sort of cut and dried and there was no negotiation. And I think that part of the thing that I have learnt and uh, Joanna, 25 years behind me, nearly 26 years behind me, is one of the things that you will learn if you haven't learnt it already, is that you have to make your allies where you can. And they may not be perfect allies, uh, but um, you never know how those allies will eventually come about and make a great change. And I'll, I'll tell you another story, which is not my story. Uh, a friend and colleague tells this story. He is a, a, a a lobbyist, for want of a better word, who works in the UK Parliament. And in the early 2000s, there was a, a, a euthanasia bill that came up in the, in the UK Parliament, as seems to happen about every two to three years. And the pro-life lobby were sort of meeting to have their initial discussions about what they would do to, to counteract this legislation and knock, knock on the ruddy door. And there was somebody who asked to come into the room who was a known pro-abortionist. And some of the people in the room said, no, 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 this work person is not welcome. She doesn't share our views, etc., etc." And And anyhow, it was, it was eventually agreed that she should be invited in. She made her case as to why she wanted to assist in helping to um, do away with this proposed pro-abortion law, pro-euthanasia law. And some of the pro-life people left the room and didn't return throughout this campaign. The interesting thing is that this woman who had come in as avowedly pro-abortion but anti-euthanasia, over the time made quite good friends with these people and eventually renounced her pro-abortion views and converted to Catholicism. So remember, you never know the sentiment and the, the disposition of the hearts of the people that you come in contact. Thank you. Robbie, can you tell incredible us a story? story? Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for that last one. That was incredible. Um, look, I find myself spending a lot of time with the just the wider community, not just the, a community of like-minded believers, or um, but a lot of... Um, of those in the, the wider sector of Brisbane and uh, all different places this has taken me. Um, and I, I think a moment for me, which was very simple yet quite powerful, was a moment I had with the uh, local uh, police liaison team at on Christmas Eve uh, to Christmas, two Christmases back. And um, a team of five um, uniformed police officers came in to a Christmas festival we were running. We opened our doors for five nights, 24 hours uh, in the lead up to Christmas day and give people an alternative to rough sleeping at that very important time in, um, in their life and the calendar year and also our, our faith life. And these uh, five officers came in uh, in uniform and I, I assumed there was a problem and uh, we would have had 60 or so uh, homeless visitors there at the time and some volunteers. It was a, an evening meal. And um, I was asked into the front room and they said to me, um, Robbie, could we have a, a private chat? And when generally I have a private chat with uh, the authorities, um, they're looking for somebody and I'm presented with either uh, 
some challenges or presented with um, yeah, just a, an opportunity to support in some way. And uh, they said to me, we just want to, there's no, there's no issue, Robbie. We just want to say to, to you and your team that, um, that whilst um, this Christmas festival has been running, there has been a decline, a decline in more than half of the um, offending that's happening in the local uh, community here in South Brisbane. And um, we've, to the point where clearly these gentlemen had the time to, to come in and uh, stay for an hour and 15 minutes. And uh, they both, the, the officers that was, were, were the main to the uh, conversation said, we'd like to thank you and your team and all those whom you represent. And we'd also like to, um, yeah, just to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. It's making a huge difference in the local community. And um, they proceeded to get personal and say, um, I, I don't believe in God, Robbie. Um, but I, if I did, uh, whatever God, you believe in and your following is would be the kind of god i'd i'd be interested in in knowing and um yeah a unique story for me to share in this forum today not a story of a of one of our visitors as such and their story of transformation but but i think more so one of of the wider networking and whereby we're very deliberate very intentional and very well known for our catholic faith and um, we don't ever shy away from that as a daily manifestation through prayer and conversation whether it be with visitors or stakeholder groups and um, we've never encountered barriers in doing so as uh, we find a great respect for the transaction and the and the exchange that happens um, in the room between some of the most broken people in our city and and the kindness that our team shows and um, and so very humbly I, I share a really beautiful story um, with the local authorities who are often deemed the bad guys in a in a movement such as um, that I'm involved in amongst our people, but it was great to be able to, uh, yeah, to, to really feel encouraged at that level and, and know that um, there's a difference being made through the church and its local mission to, um, for me, to South Brisbane. So, yeah, great opportunity we had and I'm really thankful for that, in, that, that conversation, very encouraged by it still today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robbie. Um, Joanna. Okay, so um, I think I might share a story just from my personal life. You know, there are many opportunities in my professional work to meet um, people and to make a difference. But um, I think we, um, like in every moment, there's a chance to reach in and 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 we're missionary 100% of the time. Um, so on Sunday a couple of weeks ago, I'd given a talk in the morning um, and then I was heading to just a random house in Adelaide to pick up a bookshelf on Gumtree. And I was running late because the talk had gone over and people had wanted to talk to me after the talk. And as I approached the lady's house and um, I messaged her and said, sorry, I'm running late. And I got there and I, I apologised again, sorry, I'm running late about the bookshelf because I want to organize the kids clothing and um and the books and everything and anyway she said to me oh what were you what were you up to this morning and so I said oh I was doing a talk um and I kept I I, I didn't know whether to say what the talk was about but just in a moment I felt the courage to just say it even though she was a random lady who I'd never met before and I just said look it was a talk on um late-term abortion as the greatest human rights challenge of our generation. I don't think that's what she was expecting to hear, um, but she said, oh. <laughs> and I said, I, I know it's a, it's a strange thing to be giving a talk about on a Sunday morning, but I said, you know, I didn't actually know much about this issue, but last February our parliament in SA um, legislated to allow full-term babies, up to full-term babies, to get aborted um even if there's nothing wrong with them or even if there is something wrong with them and it's not to save the life of the mum it's just there's a very broad range of reasons and she said oh, I had no idea and I said yeah I I didn't either and I think people often say oh it never happens but I've done a lot of research because I'm a lawyer and I, I looked at Victoria and I've seen how since they legislated abortion up to birth 4,186 babies have lost their life to late-term abortion and these are babies um that could have lived outside the womb and over 40 percent of those there was nothing wrong with the mum's physical health or the baby's physical health and um this lady was a bit gobsmacked on us as we made this gum tree transaction um but it was really interesting she said i had no idea that we allowed abortion after 12 weeks and so if we have the chance to just tell her that you know our laws have changed and this is what they are um 
and and to then go on to explain you know because she was open a little bit like the window was open a little bit i decided to to open it wide and just to say look what people don't realize is with a late-term abortion the the abortionist actually kills the baby in utero and then the mother has to deliver a dead baby so she actually has to go into labor and deliver the baby but the baby is has been has has had has been killed prior to um coming out of the birth canal and i said you know i am really sympathetic to women who are in really difficult pregnancy situations but i guess what i think is that baby also has human rights so why don't we just deliver the baby alive instead of killing the baby first and so it was just a chance to kind of open up that conversation and that space and um it really confirmed for me that we are called to speak truth um in both our professional and personal spheres and we're kind of never off duty um when when we're when this is what we're called to do thank you so much to all three of you for some very moving and very challenging experiences that you you've shared with us and you know my my session beforehand was about changing the culture in which we live and and the the society in which we live and I think all three of those examples were, were quite different but all spoke into that challenge so my my next question is do you see what you do as a vocation and how would you encourage others to find theirs um, I don't know whether we want to go around in the same circle or whether we'll start with Joanna perhaps <laughs> Um, so I do, I feel like my vocation is first and foremost to be a mother to these five children that I've been given, um, but that I am also called to make a contribution in the world. Um, and I think that was something I really wrestled with in my late teens, early twenties, the fact that I was, um, anxious as well as faithful and that I had things that I wanted to do and, um, when I got the chance to get a Rhodes Scholarship and go to Oxford, I thought, well, I felt like that was something that was very, that was given to me um, and it was this massive opportunity and that I had to also give back through it. Um, but I didn't know what that would look like. And so um, becoming a teacher at Adelaide University and teaching, um, you know, 300 students every year, I do feel like that is also my vocation as an educator um, to ask questions and to encourage critical thinking and to um, form the next generation to be able to not just accept blindly what they read in the newspaper, what they see on social media, or even what they would be taught by me and other colleagues, um, but to encourage them to pursue truth um, and to live lives that aren't based on a yardstick of success um, because I think that's, um, you know, in our culture today, we tell young people, you've got to be successful, you've got to be attractive. Um, that's where your self-worth is based. And so to be able to um, speak into that, I feel like that's part of my vocation as well. Thank you. We'll go to Robbie now. <laughs> yeah, clearly a vocation to um, to married life and family life at my end. Um, and um, one of one of which is lifelong, of course. And um, I think beyond there, uh, I do use the word vocation in what I do. Um, I do think, though, it's important noting that um, what I believe that um, I'm caught up in is is really the calling on every follower of Jesus's life, um, especially in our Catholic tradition, which is to to be um, you know to be there for those vulnerable in our communities, whether it's the at the Christmas table amongst our own families each year, or whether it's um, somewhere in the wider community, um, I think we're all called to that. It's not a uh, not just a calling for some, as though it's a bit like prayer for me. It's a bit, it, it's sort of it's one hundred and one pursuit and and following of Jesus, and certainly um, Matthew's gospel is very suggestive of uh, what it is, how, just how serious that calling is to the poor of of any uh, time space location opportunity we may have so um for me it has been a seed vocational in that i um i've sort of devoted um and i felt a calling to devote my time specifically to that and i've been fortunate to to, to draw a very small missionary wage and and um to try and make life work as a young as a guy with a large family in today's very difficult uh time financially but uh, I have experienced uh, divine provision in a way that um, 
yeah, I, I, uh, in a way that I truly, I know it's it's the God of the, the Old Testament is is still there. <laughs> however, um, I believe that yeah, there is there is an element of vocation. Um, however, I believe they represent um, something to be shared with every person, uh, platforms and opportunities, and and certainly um, many thousand uh, volunteers in a year from many of our Catholic schools here in Brisbane, um, some of our public schools, our Christian schools, um, thousands of students come through service learning, community engagement. So for me, it's about sharing the mission as well. So, and, and giving them a sense of responsibility. And we have a slogan that the, the poor are my responsibility too. And um, yeah, I really see young people embrace that sense of urban missionary identity themselves. So it's a switch in, well, it's a growth really in identity, which I still think points back to a, a Christ-centered vocation that we all participate in and share. Uh, if if I'm honest and and true to the words of of Matthew's gospel, so yeah, thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Thank you, Vicky. Yes, I think it is a vocation. I think that over the years I haven't always thought about it consistently as that, but I've actually in the last little while been reflecting on my vocation and perhaps and the general vocation of Catholics in the world. Um, and I've, I've, I think my new favourite book of the Old Testament is the book of Tobit because it, I think it, tell, it tells our story in a way that um, I hadn't really thought about until quite recently because here is a man of faith thrown a, sort of up, who experienced upheaval and taken out of his his comfort zone, but still lived his faith despite persecution and despite adversity. And I think that that's what we, I mean, here he is living in Nineveh and we live in a modern day Nineveh held together by the internet and, and all of this. And I think that, that whatever our calling is, we are doing it in a way which is somewhat you know, sort of disjointed, that we're still living our faith in a very and you know, Robbie's example is is fantastic, and also the capacity to give witness to lots of young people coming behind is very important. And I think that yes, it is a vocation, uh, and and I feel uh, quite comfortable in the the idea that you know we don't always see that we succeed, uh, but we also have a responsibility to no matter how disjointed our world is to live our faith as closely as we can to the way that we've been taught and that we will succeed in ways that we won't necessarily know. Can I recommend to you, Clara, I'm sure you know this poem. I'm sure I've rattled on about it before, but it was one that sat on my desk for almost all the time I was a member of the Legislative Assembly, which was uh, John Macaulay's poem called Retreat. Retreat, and yes. <laughs> uh, which, interestingly, only recently I discovered it was actually a poem that was written uh, for B.A. Santa Maria, you know, a really a man against the tide. Uh, and I think that it would be useful as a resource for people um, to, if you could, if, if you could put it in the collection of resources for this session. Yes, yes. I will find it and I will get I'll, it slotted in if I can. <laughs> uh, thank you. Well, thank you to the three of you for some very insightful and and some remarkable sharing um and, and i i love um robbie that you're evangelizing the police as well as the people on the streets um and and i think a few themes that came out there was we often have a vocation within a vocation and i sometimes get a little bit frustrated when you know vocations officers in our diocese talk about a vocation to priesthood or married life that's a state of life vocation, which some of us are called to. Other all-encompassing baptismal vocation in which the state of life vocation can become incorporated. But many of us live multiple vocations, if you like, and, and parallel vocations in trying to live out our faith. And I also particularly like the comment you made, um, Robbie, about living your vocation being a bit like prayer 
And I know when, when I do my called and gifted workshops, how do you know that you're using a charism of the Holy Spirit? And it feels a bit like prayer. Um, it feels that you are where you are supposed to be. Okay, well, thank you to all three of our panellists. Thank you for that, that wonderful input. And now we're going to cross over to our sponsors for some final words and a closing from the Archbishop. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah.